السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may his peace and blessings be upon his last and final messenger, his family, his companions and those who follow them until the end of times. Alhamdulillah, last week, last Wednesday, we restarted our series and we were able to cover the meanings of verses 25 through 29. And inshallah tonight what we'll do is we'll explore the meanings of the next four verses, verses 30 through 34. Now just as a quick reminder, a quick overview, the verses that we covered last week, they dealt with the topic of Hajj, which happens to be the name of the surah as well. So the verses, they talked about the origins of Hajj, as well as some of the objectives and some of the goals behind the rituals and rites of Hajj. So we learned first and foremost that Ibrahim salam, he was shown the location of the Kaaba, so that he could reconstruct it, he could rebuild it, and establish it as a center of worship for believers until the end of times. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, وَإِذْ بَوَّأْنَا لِإِبْرَاهِيمَ مَكَانَ الْبَيْتِ Mention to your people, remind them of the time when Ibrahim السلام, was shown the physical location of the Kaaba so that he could reconstruct it, he could rebuild it and establish it for those people who perform tawaf, for those people who stand in prayer, for those people who bow down and those people who prostrate. Yani those people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without any partners. And as soon as he finished building the Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ Make the proclamation of Hajj to all of mankind. And if you do so, يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضامر. Then the people will come to you on foot and on every type of mode of transportation. So literally when he made this announcement, again we, we, we covered in the narration that every single human being that was ever meant to perform Hajj in the future responded by saying لَبَّيْكَ Allahumma لَبَّيْكَ That at your service, O Allah, at your service. And then people from that time started flocking towards the Kaaba in these great numbers, coming on foot in every single mode of transportation. يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجِّنْ عَمِيقٍ Coming from every single deep mountain pass, which means again from every single corner of the world. So every single believer who has performed Hajj since that time and who will perform Hajj in the future again is responding to this call of Ibrahim salam. So we learn that Hajj in and of itself it is a celebration of the legacy of Ibrahim salam. Khalilullah, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the rites, all of the rituals, everything you do throughout the entire Hajj journey it's a celebration of the life, the sacrifice, the submission, the devotion, and the worship of Ibrahim salam. So Sayyid Qutb rahimullah, he actually has a very uh, unique quote, a unique passage in his tafsir when talking about this. So he wrote, people's spirits roam around the house, they roam around the Kaaba, recalling memories that are associated with it and see near and distant images. The memory of Ibrahim salam as he leaves his small child Ismail salam, born to him in old age, yet whom he left alone with his mother. As he turned away to leave, he addresses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a prayer that Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zar'in inda baytika al muharram liyuqim al sana. Faj'al afidatam min al nasi tahwi ilayhim warzukhum min al thamarati la'allahum yashkurun. When Ibrahim السلام, left his young child Ismail as an infant with his wife Hajar, he's leaving and he's making this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our Lord, Rabbana, I have settled my offspring in a valley without cultivation. Mecca was a valley that was absolute desert. There's nothing there. There's no vegetation, no growth, no water. So buy your sacred house so that they may establish regular prayers. So cause you people's hearts to incline towards them and provide them with fruits so that they may give thanks. So when a person goes for Hajj, they're reminded of this scene. They're reminded of this sacrifice of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They're reminded about this act of worship and submission. 
we remember Hajal as she tries to find water for herself and her young child in that exceedingly hot place where the sacred house was yet to be built. We see her dashing to and fro between the two hills of as Safa and Al-Marwa. Feel her exceeding thirst and watch her fear for her child as she's weighed down with strenuous effort involved. She returns after covering the distance seven times, feeling something approaching despair, only to find water springing up between the blessed child's hands. That water was the well of Zamzam, a spring of mercy in the middle of a barren desert. So when a person goes for Hajj, they're reminded of this sacrifice or this, this sense of almost despair of the mother of Ismail salam. How she's all alone in the middle of this desert with her child, they ran out of food, there's no water to drink, and she's desperately running in between these two mountains of as safa and Al-Marwa. And then when she finishes running between them seven times, they find the well or the spring of Zamzam. So we still do this today, right? In celebration of this, we walk in between as safa and Marwa seven times. We recall the memory of Ibrahim salam and his vision, his dream. How he had no hesitation in offering his first son as a sacrifice. He carries a believer's submission to its highest standard. He said, Dear son, um, Ya Bunay, I have seen in a dream that I should offer you as a sacrifice. Consider then what would be your view. Right? Inni anni right? I have seen in a dream that I am sacrificing you. So what's your opinion? What do you think you should do? And his son Ismail answered with equal submission, equal obedience that demonstrates self-surrender to Allah in its clearest sense. He answered, Ya abati, if'al ma tu'mar. That, O oh my father, do as you have been commanded. Satajiduni insha'Allahu min as sabirin But you will find me, if God so wills, one who is patient in adversity. But then God's grace is bestowed upon them and the son is released with a sacrifice sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these things were reminded of them as we're going throughout the rites and rituals of Hajj. And the essence of every, you know, the, the, the moral of the story of Ibrahim salam is a moral of absolute submission. That what's required from us as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we completely submit to his will. Whatever he asks us to do, we do it without any hesitation whatsoever. And the reason why we do it is because we are Muslim. And a Muslim is one who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all his external parts, right? In terms of his heart, his internal submission and external submission as well. So in summary, again, the previous verses, they mentioned the story of how the Kaaba was built and the basis upon which it was established. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he turns to the topic of respecting and honoring his sanctities. Something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself terms as Hurumatullah. Hurumatullah. The sanctities or the sacred ordinances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sacred. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that ذلك ومن يعذم حرمات الله فهو خير له عند ربي وأحلت لكم الأنعام إلا ما يتلى عليكم فاجتنبوا الرجس من الأوثان واجتنبوا قول الزور All this is ordained by Allah. Anyone who honors the sacred ordinances of Allah will have good rewards from his Lord. Livestock have been made lawful to you except for what has been explicitly forbidden. Shun the filth of idolatrous beliefs and practices and shun false utterances. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's starting this verse with the word ذَلِكَ In the Arabic language, this word is known as an ismul ishara. It's a demonstrative pronoun. So it's a pronoun, it's a, it's a noun that's used to refer to something or to point to something. Specifically something that's in the distance. So for example, in Arabic you'd say ذَلِكَ kitabun. That is a book. Or ذَلِكَ رَجُلٌ That is a man. But over here, it's being used to separate between two different trains of thought. It's being used to separate between two different concepts or two different ideas. So the commentators mention the word ذَلِكَ here. It's the subject of a sentence that is understood from the context of the verse. And the meaning is that all that has just been mentioned, ذَلِك, what was just mentioned in the verses before, in terms of establishing the Kaaba as a center of worship, 
In terms of the act of Hajj itself, the Tawaf, sacrificing in Allah's name, all of it has been ordained, has been commanded, has been in, in, initiated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So oftentimes this word again, ذلك, it's used to distinguish between two different thoughts or two different ideas. And here it's being used in a similar manner. That ذلك, what has been mentioned, it's established, it is a proof. And then, وَمَن يُعَذِّمْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّي So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions the importance, the significance of recognizing, respecting, and honoring those things that He has made sacred. Anyone who honors the sacred ordinances of Allah will have good rewards from His Lord. So the word Al-Hurumat, right, the word is Hurumatullah, the sacred ordinances of Allah. And the word hurumat, it's the plural of the word hurma. And the word hurma in the Arabic language, it's usually translated as something sacred or a sacred ordinance from Allah. And the commentators, the mufassirun, they have explained this word in a number of different ways. So some of the commentators, they mention that the hurumatullah are referring to all the rules of the sharia. Every single rule that we find in the Quran or the sunnah, is included within Hurumatullah. So all of the commands, all of the awamir, all of the prohibitions, all of the nawahi, everything that has been commanded or prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is included within Hurumatullah. So all the legal obligations that we have as believers. Others mention it's referring to everything that's prohibited during Hajj. So since the context is talking about the act of Hajj itself, they say that what's meant by Hurumatullah are those things that are prohibited during Hajj. So when a person enters into the state of Ihram, he enters into the state of pilgrim sanctity, certain things become impermissible upon him. So for example, in the state of Ihram, you can't cut your nails, you can't cut your hair, you can't apply fragrance to your body. And then specifically during Hajj, Allah mentions three prohibitions. وَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا جِدَانَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ فِي Hajj, that there's no jidal, there's no fusuq, there's no rafath during hajj. Jidal is arguing. So arguing and disputing, obviously it's, it's a sin in the first place. But when a person is performing hajj and they're in the state of ihram, it's much worse. The magnitude of the, the, magnitude of the sin is increased. Fusuq are acts of disobedience. Rafath, it refers to being obscene in speech or in behavior. So some say that hurumatullah, they're referring to these rules and regulations or prohibitions that are associated with hajj. And others mention that it's, there are five hurumat of Allah. There are five sacred ordinances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first they say is al-masjidul haram. The sacred mosque itself, the mosque that's built around the Kaaba. The second is the Kaaba itself. The Kaaba itself is sacred. The third is called the sacred mash'ar, which they say it's the plain of Muzdalifah. The fourth is the sacred city, yani the entire haram. And the fifth is the sacred month of Muharram. So that's one of the opinions as well. So basically when Allah says, and whoever honors the sacred ordinances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's referring to anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sacred. Anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded or prohibited. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that those individuals who recognize, honor, and respect these hurumat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be rewarded. فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّي He will have reward with his Lord. So in terms of just showing respect, we will be rewarded. And the commentators mentioned the way to show respect is by following the commandments. Right? The way we show respect for the hurumat of Allah is by following His commandments and staying away from His prohibitions to the best of our abilities. As long as we're trying, as long as we're putting some effort, as long as we're consciously giving it our best, then we will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that, that's the only thing that Allah wants from us. Allah simply wants us to try. He wants, it to give, he wants us to give it our best. And that's something the Prophet sallallahu told us. He said, إِنَّكُمْ لَن تَسْتَطِيعُوا أَن تَفْعَلُوا كُلَّ مَا أُمِرْتُكُمْ بِهِ That none of you will be able to do every single thing that you have commanded to do. وَلَكِنْ سَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا But, you know, try hard and get as close as possible. Right? Try hard and be as close as possible to obeying all of the commandments of Allah and staying away from all of His 
prohibitions. And if we do so, then we're rewarded for both. You're rewarded for obeying the commandments and you're also rewarded from staying away from the prohibitions. And that is something that's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even when we consciously stay away from haram, Allah rewards us for that. And if we're consciously controlling our tongue, we're consciously controlling our eyes, we will be rewarded. Now in the next part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that only those things He has made sacred should be considered sacred. That He alone has the right to legislate, to make rulings, to make things permissible or impermissible. Not human beings, not local customs or cultures. Right? Al-hukmu lillah. The judgment, the rulings, the legislation belong solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the reason why this is being mentioned in the verse is that the polytheists of Mecca, right, the non-believers of Mecca, they had a lot of customs and cultural norms that became a part of their religion. It became a part of their faith. So they used to consider certain types of animals as sacred. There were certain animals that they had that they would consider to be sacred that they themselves had dedicated to their idols. So for example, a she-camel whose milk was dedicated to the idols. No one was allowed to drink that milk and as a sign that its milk was dedicated to the idols, its ear would be cut in a particular manner. And this type of she-camel was given a specific name, Al-Bahira. It was called Al-Bahira. There was another type of she-camel that was set free in the name of the idols. No one was allowed to use it, eat it, or do anything with it. And this was known as a Sa'iba. So a bunch of these different types of animals are mentioned in the Qur'an. They're mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why they're mentioned is that Allah is reminding us that as human beings, we don't have the authority to make things that are permissible, impermissible. The only being who makes things unlawful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the polytheists, they used, uh, they used to attribute sanctity to these animals while dishonoring all of the other rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear that all livestock are lawful to eat except those that have been explicitly forbidden in the Qur'an. وَأُحِلَّتْ لَكُمُ anam. This is a general blanket statement. All an'am, livestock, camels, cows, goat, sheep, ram, etc. have been made permissible for you. إِلَّا مَا يُتْنَى عَلَيْكُمْ Except for that which has been recited to you. Except that which has been revealed to you. And that revelation comes in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly mentions those types of animals that are prohibited to eat, those types of animals that are unlawful to eat. So this explicit prohibition is mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah and even elsewhere where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالْدَّمُ وَنَحْمُ الْخِنْزِينَ وَمَا أُحِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُنْخَنِقَةُ وَالْمَوْقُوذَةُ وَالْمُتَرَدِّيَةُ وَالنَّطِيحَةُ وَمَا أَكَلَ السَّبْعُ إِلَّا مَا ذَكَّيْتُمْ وَمَا ذُبِحَ عَلَى النُّصُبُ Prohibited to you are dead animals, carrion. Right? So the first type of animal that you can't eat is an animal that has been killed in an unlawful manner. So an animal that dies naturally itself or gets hit by a car or falls off a cliff or whatever it may be, any type of carrion, any type of dead animal is impermissible to consume. Right? The flesh of swine and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. And those animals killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the goring of horns. And those from which a wild animal has eaten except what you are able to slaughter before its death and those which are sacrificed on stone altars. So basically, إِلَّا مَا يُتْلَعْ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah has explicitly mentioned what type of animals are prohibited to eat. Again, the purpose of mentioning this here in this context in this verse is to show that we shouldn't consider anything to be lawful or unlawful, permissible or impermissible unless told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That is the main moral of the verse. That is the main lesson. That we as human beings do not have the authority to declare something that's lawful as unlawful or something that's unlawful as lawful. That right belongs solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the shari'. He is the legislator. He's the one that make, makes the rules and regulations. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَاجْتَنِبُوا الرِّجِسَ مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ وَاجْتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ الزُّورِ Shun the filth of idolatrous beliefs and practices and shun false utterances, shun false statements. Meaning stay away 
distance yourself, avoid and shun the filth of idols. Anything associated with the belief and practices of idol worship, and it has been described as filth, it's been described as a rijs because it contaminates a person's mind, heart, morals, and character, just like filth contaminates a garment. All right, so this is a very unique expression that's being used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he's describing false belief. He's describing the worship of idols, describing polytheism as a rijs And rich in the Arabic language, it literally means physical impurity, something that's filthy, something that's dirty, that it gets on your clothes, you can't even pray in it. It makes your clothes impure. So just like physical impurities soil your clothes, impure beliefs, right? Whether it's any type of impure belief, it soils a person's heart, it, it dirties a person's mind, it messes with their character, with their morals, with their ethics. And then Allah also reminds us to stay away and avoid false speech. قول الزور. Now false speech, قول الزور, it's a very broad term. It includes all types of sins of the tongue. Whether it's lying, whether it's deception, cheating, slander, and backbiting. So it's narrated that the Prophet ﷺ, he once asked his companions, Shall I not inform you of the worst of the major sins? Should I not tell you of the worst of the major sins? So the companions عنهم, they said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. So he replied, Al Ishraku Billah. Then he said, وَعُقُوقُ الْوَالِدِينَ And إِشْرَكُوا بِاللَّهِ Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The second one was عُقُوقُ الْوَالِدِينَ Being disrespectful to your parents And the narrator mentions that when he said this He was leaning against something And then he stood up straight Or he sat up straight And he mentioned وَالشَّهَادَةُ الزُّورُ وَقَوْلُ الزُّورُ And indeed giving false statements And indeed bearing false witness and he kept on repeating it until we wished that he would stop. So basically the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mentioned that there are four sins that are considered to be the major of the major sins. All right, these are sins that we should avoid at all costs. The first is obviously al-ishraku billah. The worst thing a person can do is associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Indeed shirk is the worst of the injustices that can be done. After that, at the second level, is عُقُوقُ الْوَالِدَيْنِ Being disrespectful, dishonoring your parents. And then the third and fourth have to do with one speech. شَهَادَةُ الزُّورِ Bearing false witnesses, giving false testimony. وَقَوْلُ الزُّورِ Which is false statements, lying, slandering, backbiting, etc. And the Prophet ﷺ, he emphasized this. So he kept repeating it until some of the companions were like, we wish he would have stopped. Right. Similarly, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said three times, bearing false witness is on par with association of others with Allah. Bearing false witness is on par. It's just as bad as associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he mentioned this three times and then he recited this particular verse. فَاجْتَنِبُ الرِّجْسَ مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ وَاجْتَنِبُ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ Alright, so again, the whole purpose of this particular verse is to remind us about respecting the sanctities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hurumat of Allah. And the way we respect them and honor them is by obeying them, by obeying His commandments and staying away from His prohibitions. And included within staying away from His prohibitions is staying away from the filth of shirk and staying away from the filth of false speech. Alright, so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us to be truthful to our faith, to turn away from falsehood and immorality and work towards the truth and morality. So he wants us to be absolutely sincere in our belief and shun all types of associating partners with him to maintain purity of faith and practice. So Allah tells us, that devote yourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and assign no partners with him. For the person who does so is like someone who has been hurled down from the skies and snatched up by the birds or flung to a distant, distant place by the wind. Alright, the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the verse with the word hunafa. The word hunafa 
is the plural of the word Hanif. And Hanif means a person who turns away from the false religion to the truth. So a Hanif is a person who turns away from all types of false beliefs and he comes towards the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, hold on to what's being explained in detail in these verses, Hunafa alillah, sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be true to Allah and don't associate anyone with Him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a vivid example of a person who turns away from the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and falls into shirk. So He's giving us this example to make us realize how bad shirk is. And oftentimes, you know, we really don't understand how bad shirk actually is. We just think, you know, actually we think it's hard to imagine someone associating partners with Allah. Alhamdulillah, being a Muslim, being believers, we have this belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find it strange that people would worship someone besides Allah. That people would actually worship stones and idols and things that can't give any benefit or any harm. But this is a reality throughout history. That there have always been people who worship these idols and false statues and false gods. And even till this day there are people who worship things and objects besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is giving us this vivid example to help us realize how bad shirk truly is. He says, وَمَن يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرِ That a person who associates partners with Allah is like someone who has been hurled down from the skies and snatched up by the birds. So this is an example, it's a parable to show how misguided and hopeless the one who associates partners with Allah is. Whoever associates partners with Allah who worships someone other than him is in absolute loss and destruction both in this life and the next. So they're like a person who's falling down from a great height. Right? They're like a person who's falling down from a great height, from a tall building, from the top of a mountain. So that they're hurling down from the sky. They're falling down at this extremely fast speed. And as they're falling from the sky, predatory birds come and tear them apart piece by piece until there's nothing left. So this is a very violent description by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That imagine a person falling from the top of a mountain. And as this person is falling, even before he hits the floor, these predatory birds come and they just rip them apart piece by piece until there's nothing left. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to realize that that's how bad shirk is. That's how devastating and how destructive associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then he gives us this second example. Or their example is like a person who is blown away by a severe and violent wind that throws him off into the distance with no one to help him or save him, leaving him to die. So the purpose of these two examples is to amplify the evil and destructive nature of shirk. Right, and again, that's something that as Muslims, as believers, we somewhat naturally recognize that. We recognize how evil, how awful, how destructive shirk is. And the reason why it's so destructive is when shirk settles into a person's heart, it clouds their judgment, it clouds their thoughts. You know, just think about it for a moment, worshipping an inanimate object, worshipping, worshipping a statue or idol makes absolute, I mean, it doesn't make any rational sense whatsoever. How can a person dedicate their life to a statue that can't give them any benefit or any harm whatsoever? So it corrupts a person's mind. And once a person's mind is corrupted, it corrupts their life, it corrupts their morality, it corrupts their ethics, it corrupts their practices, it corrupts their culture, it corrupts their society. And that's why you see when a society is steeped in immorality, when a society is steeped in destructive, you know, self-destructive practices and immorality, oftentimes you will find what's behind it is idolatrous practices. So if you look at the society during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, during the time of Jahiliyyah, they were perhaps the most immor immoral society you can think of. And the root cause of that is their shirk. They were worshipping things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had no fear of the consequences of their actions. They had no fear of the day of judgment. They had no fear of standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, after mentioning those who honor and respect the sacred ordinances of Allah, the need to preserve and protect these sanctities and the harm of not doing so, the surah now talks about honoring the symbols of Allah and how that's a sign of a person's taqwa. 
So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning two separate things. There's hurumatullah and then there's sha'airullah. So hurumatullah, we said these are the sacred ordinances, these are the commands, the rules of the sharia, the commands and prohibitions. Then there's something that's known as sha'airullah. ذَلِكْ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ That is so. And whoever honors the symbols of Allah, indeed it is from the piety of hearts. So for the second time in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the verse with the demonstrative pronoun, the ismu al-ishara, ذَلِكْ Again, this serves as the subject of a sentence that is understood from the context of the verse. Meaning, that all that has just been mentioned is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right? Worship or, or recognizing the sacred ordinances and honoring them All the animals that are made permissible for us Staying away from shirk and qawl azur All of this is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And then Allah mentions The importance of recognizing, honoring and respecting the symbols of Allah So the word sha'air, it's the plural of the word sha'ira And the word sha'ira means a symbol or a distinctive sign it refers to those things or objects that are considered to be the hallmarks of a specific group of people or religion. So there are those signs, those symbols, those practices, those things that are hallmarks, there are trademarks, there are symbols of a particular group of people or a religion. There are those things that are associated with Islam. Right? The Sha'airullah are those things that are automatically associated with Islam and Muslims. For example, the call to prayer. As soon as someone hears the sound of the adhan, automatically we know what? Islam, right? As long as you hear the adhan, you know that there's some Islam, that there's some Muslims. It's even mentioned in some narrations that the Prophet Sallallahu or some of the companions, when they would go to attack a certain town or village in the morning, they would wait for the time of Fajr to come in. If they would hear the sound of the adhan, they would not attack because they knew there were Muslims there. And if they didn't hear it, then they would attack because they knew there were no Muslims there. Right? The Kaaba. As soon as you see an image of the Kaaba, you think of Islam. You think of Muslims. Right? Even the hijab for sisters. As soon as you see someone wearing hijab, automatically you think Islam and Muslim. So anything that's a hallmark of Islam and Muslims is known as a sha'ira. It's a sign. It's a distinguishing feature of Muslims. So they are the identifying features of Islam and Muslims. Now most of the rites of Hajj, they are also amongst the Sha'a'im of Allah. So the act of Tawaf itself, the act of Sa'i between Safa and Marwa, um, standing on the plain of Arafah, standing on the plain of Muzdalifa, all of these actions in Hajj, pelting the Jamarat, these are all amongst the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even sacrificing the animal on the day of Nahr, on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, is also amongst the Sha'a'ir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And that's why the scholars of tafsir They have mentioned different explanations For what symbols are being referred to here Now based on the context Most mention is referring to the animals That are sacrificed as part of the rituals of Hajj So it's referring to these sacrificial animals of Hajj They are honored by choosing the best And most valuable animals for sacrifice right? Allah is saying وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ that it is our responsibility as Muslims to honor, to respect, to recognize the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it comes to the sacrificial animal of Hajj, the way we respect it and honor it is by choosing the best animal possible. By choosing the most expensive, the healthiest, the nicest animal to offer as a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself, he sacrificed a hundred camels. And during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions would choose the best animals for sacrifice. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, he narrated that his father was gifted an amazing she-camel as a gift. He was offered 300 dinars for it. Now 300 dinars is a very large amount of money. He was offered 300 dinars for this she-camel. <coughs> so he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have been gifted an amazing she-camel and have been offered 300 dinars for it. Should I sell it and buy several camels to sacrifice instead? So look at the question he's asking the Prophet Sallallahu He's saying, I already have this amazing animal that's so precious, it's so valuable, it's so expensive. But is it better for me to sell it so that I can give more animals in sacrifice, more she-camels? 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, sacrifice this one. Right? Meaning that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you is ta'zimu sha'airinna. Respecting and honoring the symbols of Allah. Again, in this context, meaning choosing the best animal possible. All right. Now, respecting and honoring the symbols of Allah is from the God consciousness in one's heart. فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ It's a sign of taqwa. When a person respects and honors any of the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any of the symbols, the hallmarks of Islam, that is a sign that the person has taqwa, that they have God consciousness, that they're aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah is establishing a relationship between the sacrifice offered by the pilgrims and the characteristic of taqwa. And the whole purpose of hajj and all of its rituals is to develop and refine our consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the whole objective behind every single act of hajj. That we are refining, improving, amplifying our consciousness of our Lord and our Creator. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us. لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ ثُمَّ مَحِلُّهَا إِلَىٰ الْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ Alright, for you in them, meaning in the animals that are marked for sacrifice, are benefits for a specified term. Then their place of sacrifice is at the ancient house. So again, the context of the verse is still talking about the sacrificial animal that's offered during the days of Hajj. لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ In them is a lot of benefit for you, meaning that there are worldly benefits for us in the sacrificial animals such as their skin, their fur, their milk, riding them and using them for transport. But these benefits can only be availed until a specified time. And they say that specified time is the day of Nahar, the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, when it has to be sacrificed. So when this time period comes, it's placed the offer where it should be sacrificed is at the sacred precinct, yani which is the, the haram, the Kaaba itself, the precincts of the haram. And the surah then tells us, وَلِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَلْ لِيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ فَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدْ فَلَهُ أَسْلِمُ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ And we appointed acts of devotion for every community. For them to celebrate God's name over the livestock He provided for them. Your God is one, so devote yourselves to Him and give good news to those who are humble. Alright, now what this means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made ritual sacrifice, an act of worship, obedience, and, and submission for all nations and religions throughout history. For every single nation, for every single community or religion throughout history, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a mansak. And that mansak is referring to this act of ritual sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not a new practice in Islam. This is not something that is unique to Islam. Rather, every single religion throughout history had some type of animal sacrifice that they gave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of submission, as an act of devotion and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, the purpose of the sacrifice was not to actually offer the meat or to give the meat. Rather, it was to remind them of their submission to Allah. The reason why they're giving the sacrifice is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to do so. Why? لِيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ and the reason for this commandment of offering a ritual sacrifice is so that they could mention or remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon what Allah has provided them in terms of livestock. Meaning when a person is sacrificing the animal, they're supposed to say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. They're supposed to remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're supposed to glorify Him and praise Him. And when a person does that, they are reminded of the fact that this blessing itself is solely from Allah. So they're reminded to be grateful, they're reminded to show thanks, they're reminded to show their humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, فَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ Your Lord is only one, فَلَهُ أَسْلِمُ So submit to Him alone as well. 
And again, this is the entire objective of Hajj. The entire objective of Hajj is Falahu Aslima. That submit yourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And if each and every single one of us submits to Allah, in the actual term of the meaning, submission, if we actually become Muslim, in the actual meaning of the word Muslim, then every single thing in this life will be easy for us. We'll be successful in this world, we'll be successful in the hereafter. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us is that absolute submission, both internally with our hearts and externally with our limbs. That every single limb of ours is in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single thing we do in the life of this world is in submission to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever He commands us to do, we try our best to do it. Whatever He tells us to stay away from, we try our best to stay away from it. فَدَهُ أَسْلِمُ And then the Prophet ﷺ is told, وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ And give glad tidings, give good news, give good fortune to those who are humble. To those who have humility before their Lord and their Creator. To those who humble themselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the next verse, or the next few verses, it actually describes who the mukhbitin are. That who are these people? Who are those who have humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are their characteristics? What are their traits? What are their qualities? And inshallah, that is what we will discuss next week. Inshallah. Ayo bashirin mukhbitin. Alright, so again, in summary, the entire process of hajj, the whole moral of hajj is aslimu. Submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah to give all of us the tawfiq, the ability to become Muslims in the proper sense of the word. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to submit to Him in every single thing we do and say. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us, to reward us, to place this on our scale of good deeds on the Day of Judgment, to give us an understanding of the Qur'an, to make the Qur'an a part of our daily lives, and to give us the tawfiq to act upon it as well inshallah. Any questions?